This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church in Enid, Oklahoma. Would you join me in our call to worship from Psalm 86? Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, did the insolent rise up against me. A band of ruffians seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn, Turn to me, me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. servant. Save the child of your serving girl. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Our opening hymn today is Here in This Place. of Israel and cornerstone of our common life. You are not bound by our visions, our structures, or our doctrine. We cannot predict your coming or going, yet you have given us your story, your family, your work to do. Meet us here. Shape us for service in your world, for we carry the name of Jesus and live by the power of your breath. Amen. People of God, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. We did not receive a spirit of servitude to fall back into fear, but we have received a spirit of adoption. Let us then confess our sin with freedom of children who know how deeply 
they are loved. Merciful God, your creatures cry, creation groans, but we turn away. We surround ourselves with noise. We are quick to excuse ourselves from responsibility. We are young, we are old, we are tired, we are busy. It is hard to imagine that we might make a difference. Life-giving God, wash us clean. Restore our imaginations and our hearts. Let your courage and compassion flow through our veins until we love with abandon and our hands reach out in blessing. Your whole creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. May we stand firmly with you as you transform the world around us. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God says unequivocally, irrevocably, you are my own, you are forgiven, and I need you to be about my business in the world. Thanks be to God. time I invite you to pass the peace of Christ with those who are gathered with you in worship today. If you are worshiping alone, please be assured that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding is with you now and always. May the peace of Christ be with you. I'd like to spend some time now with our children. My friends, I have a question to ask you today, and it's this. What is the most common phrase in the Bible? I'll give you a second to think about it. What is the most common phrase in the Bible? You may think it has something to do with love, since that's pretty much what the Bible's all about. You may think it has something to do with God or with Jesus or maybe prayer or worship, but here it is. The most common phrase in the Bible is do not be afraid. And do you know how many times that phrase can be found in the Bible? 365. Hmm, that sounds like a familiar number. What else has 365 in it? That's right, a year. A year has 365 days, and that's how many times the Bible 
says, do not be afraid. We're about to hear one of those instances from the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah is speaking to a group of people who had everything to be afraid of. Their homes were being invaded. Their fields were being destroyed. Their children didn't have the opportunities that their parents wished they'd had. And God says, do not be afraid. I'm with you. And that promise is still good today. You might be afraid of something right now. Maybe you're afraid to go back to school. Maybe you're afraid to stay at home. Maybe you're afraid about what you're going to eat next or what you're going to wear. But listen to what God says to you. Do not be afraid. God is with you, my friends. Whether you can feel it or not, God is there. Don't forget, God is with you. Let's pray together. We thank you, God, that for every day we are alive, you say to us, do not be afraid. Sometimes we are, and we know that that's okay, because you are always with us. Be with all of us. Be especially near to our children. Bless them and keep them. Let your face shine upon them as they grow up and navigate a very complex world. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Hebrew scripture lesson today comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, reading in chapter 44, verses 1 through 8. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you in the womb and will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, Jerusalem, who I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They shall spring up like a green tamarisk, like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will be called by the name of Jacob, yet another will write on the hand the Lord's and adopt the name of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God beside me? There is no rock. I know not one.
gospel lesson today comes to us from Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and verses 36 through 43. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in the field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds and the field. Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. Would you pray with me, please? Oh God, may these my simple words become for us light today by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. In 1933, the American theologian H. Richard Niebuhr published an article infamously titled, The Grace of Doing Nothing. As you can assume from the date of publication, this article was directed toward the conversation in the United States about whether or not to intervene in the growing conflict created by Japan's invasion of Northeast Asia. In that article, that would later be refuted by his brother, who was another prominent American theologian, Niebuhr argues that doing nothing is not the same as not doing anything. In fact, he says doing nothing is actually a deliberate and patient act of faith. There are times, Niebuhr says, when doing nothing is ethically necessary because the unintended consequences of doing something in the face of evil can often end up destroying the very thing one is trying to preserve. Niebuhr's thoughts were profound at the time, although they did not prevail. Niebuhr's caution, though, against unintended consequences is tragically seen in just about every act of violence or war that one person or a nation inflicts upon another. The parable we've heard today from Jesus was the scriptural foundation of H. Richard Niebuhr's argument. In this parable, Jesus calls on agricultural imagery, just as he did in the parable we heard last week. And he tells the story of a farmer who sowed good wheat seed into his field. But in the night, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then ran away. So as the wheat grew, so too did the weeds. 
Perplexed as to what to do, the farmer's workers came and asked if the farmer wanted them to gather up the weeds to get rid of them. But the farmer warned them and told them to do nothing, because in uprooting the weeds, the wheat might also be destroyed. Instead, the farmer instructs the workers to just wait, to let the weeds and the wheat grow together until the time of the harvest. Then at the harvest, the farmer tells the reapers to collect the weeds first, bind them together to be burned, and then gather the wheat into the barn. Later on, Jesus explains the parable. And it's here that we begin to see just exactly what Jesus is advocating in the face of evil in the world. It may come as a surprise to us, but Jesus is in fact urging us to do nothing as we watch evil grow up among all of the good things that happen in this world. There's two things that I want to consider with you today that might help us understand why Jesus says such a strange thing. First, Jesus places a strong emphasis on the devil being the one who came and sowed the weeds in the wheat field. In the Protestant tradition, we don't talk much about the devil. I think the idea of personified evil, it scares us and causes us to leave talk of it to the more charismatic Christian traditions. But the devil, or Satan, or the deceiver, played a significant role in Jesus' life, and a significant role in the stories that he continues to tell us today. This tells us that Jesus knew and believed that there was an embodiment of evil present in the world. In this case, the evil one came in the night and walked through that farmer's very carefully prepared field and sowed all these terrible things. It wasn't the farmer's fault. It was not the fault of the workers or the reapers. It was not the fault of the society. The farmer did not deserve the weeds for some past misdeed. The farmer simply became a victim of something out of their control. And that might be the other reason we don't like to talk about the devil. The devil is an existential crisis for anyone who likes to have any sort of control on the world around them. And I think that's something we all want. When we get hurt, when we suffer pain or tragedy, we like to have some place to put the blame. A disease, someone ran a red light, extreme religion. But the devil's much harder to pin down, though very, very real. The presence of the devil in the world also causes us to re-examine the ways we encounter and treat one another. We might say that this person or that one is evil, but what if they are under the control of something we can never see or name? This demands that we treat each other better with more respect and dignity, even if we utterly disagree with how someone is living their life. So in this parable, Jesus is actually offering us a word of hope. The terrible things we endure in this life might not be our fault or anyone else's, but simply the work of evil trying to tear us away from God. Evil's presence in the world is not something we've earned. But it's also not something we have too much control over either. And that brings us to the second thing I want to consider with you today. The presence of evil in the world is real. And though we might not have power to control it or destroy it or even rein it in for a while, we are a people who know and believe that one day evil will be fully vanquished. In the parable, the farmer tells the workers to be patient as the weeds and the wheat grow together, because it's at the harvest that everything will be sorted out. That's what Jesus, that was his way of describing the end of the age. That's another tricky concept of Christian faith. But in it, we have hope that what we see each day, what we experience each moment, that's not the ultimate reality of God's kingdom. 
end times, end of the age, the apocalypse, whatever you want to call it, there will come a time in God's good time when the trials and temptations and terribly heavy cares of this world will be wiped away for good. There will come a time when humanity stops taking up arms against one another. There will come a time when the nat natural inclination of our hearts to greed and self-righteousness will finally and fully be snuffed out by God's love. There will come a time when religions will live together in harmony and people of every race and nation and clan and tribe will share a hand of fellowship in the bonds of peace. If any of these things seem impossible or farther away than we could ever imagine, then we've truly grasped just how much God loves us and the whole creation. The time will come and the wheat will be gathered into the barn and the weeds will be burned with unquenchable fire. So with these two strongholds of hope, what do we do? What do we do? How do we move forward with Christ into God's future? Even though the weeds grow thick, we must continue to proclaim that Christ and no one or anything else is Lord. Though the weeds grow thick, we must continue to feed the hungry as an indictment on a market society that deems them unworthy of bread. Though the weeds grow thick, we must stand against all the isms that rank us like cattle in a livestock auction. Though the weeds grow thick, we must extend a hand or an elbow of peace to our neighbors because peace won't touch the world until it touches the plot of ground that we stand on. Though the weeds grow thick, we must welcome the outcast, the broken, the refugee, because at any moment, in a moment, that could be you and me. Though the weeds grow thick, we must resist anything and everything that denies life, that denigrates life, that reduces life to a statistic that minimizes just how hard it is sometimes to be alive. And though those weeds grow thick, our concern is not with them, but in nourishing the wheat so that when the harvest comes, God has to build more and more and more barns because there's so much grain to bring in. We're in the long game here, my friends, and so too is God. There's pain and tragedy there's evil sown by one that we cannot see or name, but it will never win out against God's harvest. So in our place and our time, let's be about God's work of growing the grain bigger, of showing the love more generously, of giving of ourselves more selflessly, of opening ourselves in more generous hospitality, of clinging to faith and hope and not fear and despair. Remember, doing nothing about the weeds is not not doing anything. There's plenty for us to do. And as we do these things we know to be central to our faith, we do so in hope that the harvesters will one day come. The grain will be gathered into the barn. And the weeds, their luck isn't so good. May the name of the Lord be praised. Amen. Using the words of the Apostles' Creed, let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Amen. We come now to the time in our weekly worship service where I invite you to think about the ways you can give back to God by giving to the church in response to the good news of the gospel. There are the usual ways by mailing your offering here to the church. You may also visit fpcenid.com and follow the Give Now link to give electronically. Throughout this pandemic, with the help of our church's leadership, this congregation, though the doors have been closed, the church has not shut down. And in fact, none of our ministries, aside from gathering in person for worship and fellowship, none of our ministries have ceased. And in fact, one of our most important ministries has seen an increase in need. That is, of course, our Saturday Mana program. And as you watch this video on Sunday, you'll remember that we are recording this on Saturday. And just about an hour and a half ago, our MANA servers ran out of food 12 minutes into service. We normally serve from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., but this week the need was so great that one of our deacons had to go out and buy a bunch of pizzas just to meet the growing need. What we're seeing at MANA is a bit of a ripple effect that the economy shut down, people received their stimulus money and their unemployment, but now people are really, really hurting. So I ask you to once again consider your gifts to that program. And that's easy this month because the mission committee has once again designated the Deacons Fund as the special mission offering. If you give your offering through the mail, please designate on the check where you would like your offering to go. If you want to give to the Deacons Fund electronically, when you're led to the website to give, there's a way you can change the fund to, to reflect special mission offering, and that's where that gift will go. Again, the church doors have been closed, but the church has not shut down, and that's because of your generosity. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to prayer. Holy and gracious God, through the parables of Jesus, we learn many things. You are the master gardener and the harvester. We are the good soil, the seeds, the wheat, the sowers. These images remind us that faith is not static, but something that takes root, needs to be nourished, and will grow to produce abundant fruit, if the conditions are right. Make us good soil. Make us generous sowers, and make us wise farmers who nurture the wheat, even among the weeds, so that the harvest will be plentiful. God of grace and mercy, we ask that you help us in particular today to remember that our calling is to nurture the wheat we see in the world. Help us to know that when we see and experience evil, that it is yours to root out and burn and that we are to double down on the good and generous things Jesus has taught us. Stop us from getting up on soap boxes or high horses. Instead, help us to bend down in love to those most in need. We know that the weeds will continue to grow, so give us strength and courage to love, to show mercy, to extend grace. God, you are mother and father to us all, and yet we live in a world that teaches us to segregate ourselves from one another because of any number of reasons, most of which are arbitrary. The deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Sergeant Craig Johnson display to us that we live in a world filled with racism, fear, violence, and hopelessness. Give us grace to repent of the ways that we have given in to these terrible sins and give us strength to amend our ways in order to create with you a better world. Merciful Lord, you are the great healer of your people. Heal those who suffer this day from the coronavirus and all other diseases and ailments, whether in mind, body, or circumstance. Stand firmly with doctors and nurses whose work is degraded by those who believe that there's nothing happening in our world. Stand firmly with shopkeepers, hourly workers, 
and all other employees who have to deal with the worst of our human nature when simply asking us to cover our faces in love. Show us the way of compassion as we live in a divided world. Shepherd of the flock, we pray that you will lead us. We try so hard to do what we think is right, but we end up walking down the wrong path. We forget that you lead us, and we just need to follow. Show us the paths we are to take in these uncertain times and help us to put aside our need to control so that in walking with you, your will will be done. Hear us, God, of all as we offer these prayers to you today and those that remain silently written on our hearts. For we pray in the name of Jesus as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is, In Christ There Is No East or West. People of God, the harvesters will come, the grain will be collected into the barn, and the weeds will be burned with fire. Until that time comes, though, let us be about the work of God, nourishing that wheat with love, generosity, and grace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and always. Amen. Amen.